We live in Thailand and we have no fellowship that we go to. We're not a part of anything. And so if we had to call any place home on earth, it would be here. So thank you. Thank you for your love and, and especially the leadership of this church. The way they've honored us and blessed us and looked after us. Glenn has seen me at my best and has seen me at my worst. Um, when I was going through the worst time of my life, uh, he was the first person I spoke to. And uh, he was his graciousness, his kindness, uh, I will never forget. He and I have enjoyed a wonderful break. It was too short in uh, Tobago. Uh, we went to Trinidad and then we, went, we flew across to Tobago. And uh, it was just after, I think, your 40th birthday. And uh, we've got pictures of me in a better shape in those days. Um, and he, he just looks as good even up to today. So thank you. Sarah sends love to all of you that know her, and uh, Sonia knows her very well. She's been with us on an apostolic adventure. My wife is an adventure. I want to tell you, she never stops. She is the most faithful person I've ever met in my life. She just goes for it the whole time. So she's, I, I know her whole mission is to keep me young, and uh, she's doing it. I, I feel, I feel good. I feel. <clears throat> See, that's the only place I can be like this. <laughs> Throughout my my Christian walk, I've always had a passion to understand principles, things that make us effective, things that cause us to have the the impact, the. Uh, touch of God on our life, the miraculous flowing through us. I've always longed to understand what causes that. I don't believe God plays games with us. I don't believe he plays hide and seek. I believe if you cry out for wisdom, it will come to you. And so from very young, I've realized God promises me, if you lack wisdom, ask me and I'll give it to you. And so into my ministry years, probably about 10 years into my ministry, somebody called me Saul. And I didn't know what they were saying. I said, why do you call me Saul? They said, we call, because you're like Solomon. You're the wisest person we know. That was such an encouragement from a member of my congregation. And so God has revealed so many of these principles to me. And today I want to share with you something about what causes us to be able to go through the worst times of our lives, what causes us to keep <coughs> excuse me, producing fruit, not just fruit, but more fruit and much fruit? What, what causes us to be what Jesus said we can become? I believe that it, it has to do with the core values we hold, the decisions we made throughout our Christian walk. I believe it's got to do with the fact that we have made choices to live a culture which is different to this world totally. I believe at the very core of our being, what guides us is based on the choices we've made. So you will only find out who you really are at the worst times of your life when you have no control over all that's going on around you. When life is unraveling in front of you and you, you don't know what move to make next, you go into almost autopilot and that autopilot comes from the, the years of, of decision making you've made. I believe there are four things that are crucial for you and I to, to keep going the way he plans us to go. To keep having the impact we should have. Jesus gave us a model of these things in the last hours he was on earth. He showed in the worst time of his life, when all hell was coming against him, he showed that these principles were his guiding stars. They were the ones that took him to the cross. They were the ones that caused you and I today to enjoy eternal life because he made the right choices. So many a time in our lives, we make a wrong choice. 
and wrong choices are costly. Are you the conservative or the charismatic crowd? <laughs> you're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna be nice to me today, aren't you? Okay, I wanna hear a big amen? amen. Right, all right. Work with me. You know, you know I get motivated. If, if you look like you're getting excited, I'm gonna get excited. And then who knows what's gonna happen. So Jesus models this to us, and the very first thing that Jesus models that I believe is critical for you and I to live out every single day of our life is what is called sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. I don't, I don't know that we will ever realize how much we miss by not listening to God. I don't know if we will ever fully comprehend how many lives have missed the blessing of God because we have not chosen to be obedient. But of course, we in our own hearts long to, to be obedient because the very sign of our love toward God is that we obey His commands. We do what He tells us to do. We go where He tells us to go. I, I want to tell you, obedience is critical for, for your impact on this earth. Jesus told Peter clearly, he said, you in your old age are going to go where you didn't want to go. You're going to be led where you didn't want to go. Remember my little prayer before I came to you. Lord, send me anywhere in the world but America. <laughs> Here I am. I fought against coming here. But when I realized it was the will of the Lord, I obeyed. Amen. I went into Johannesburg. I prayed the prayer, Lord, don't take me to Johannesburg or America. Those are the only two places. Anywhere else is fine. <laughs> when I went to Johannesburg, I want to tell you, I walked into 21 years of the greatest pain I, I know any human being has ever endured. I went through hell and back many times. You name it, pretty much, I've been through it. And for 21 years I sat saying, Lord, why did you bring me here? I remember the very first week I was in the, in, in the, the um, church. I was to preach on the Sunday, Saturday afternoon. I got down to wait on the Lord. And I'm a type of person, I don't know about most other preachers, but I cannot preach if I haven't heard from God. God has to tell me what to say. Otherwise, I'm stuck. I, I, I don't have another model. So I get, now you must understand, I've got a choice whether I want to stay in Johannesburg or go to another town called Dundee, which is lovely. It's in the mountains. It's beautiful. You know where my heart is, don't you? <laughs> right, Dundee. So I go to get to prayer. I go down to prayer and uh, <laughs> God doesn't talk to me. 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour, two hours. I'm crying out to him. I say, God, why won't you talk to me? He said, because I'm waiting for you to make a decision. About what? Dundee or Johannesburg. So I said, Lord, you know I don't want to stay here. I don't like this place. Think of the place you like the least on earth. And God tells you to go and live there. Johannesburg is crime ridden. It is a horrible place to me. Maybe to other people it's not. I don't like it. So God just goes quiet again. And we sit and we sit and we sit. Eventually I realize I've got no choice. So I said, okay, Lord, that, I'll accept it on condition that you double this congregation. I only had 22 people. You double this congregation for three years in a row. Deal done. I stood up first Sunday, I said, I just want to tell you, I didn't ask to be here, God put me here. So if any of you are thinking of leaving, I give you the same choice. Don't leave, you stay. <laughs> if I can't choose, you can't choose. <laughs> I said, if you'll stay, this will double first year, double the second year, double the third year. It's exactly what happened. We broke out of the seams, we went mad. But then came all the trouble. 
God will take you where you don't want to go. God will take you where you love being. But you'll always have to go where God wants you to be. Jesus stood in the garden and he said, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. I'm willing to, to, to bow the knee. Lord, I'm asking you to take this cup from me. These cups we don't want to drink, right? There's things we don't want to go through. There's times we're not happy about facing. We, there's, there's things like that. And in those moments, you've got to have a type of a relationship with God that you practiced before the trauma. And that is absolute obedience when God speaks. Sarah and I were, uh, were, were looking for an opportunity for extra um, training facilities um, on our apostolic adventure in a place called Kanchanaburi. Kanchanaburi in Thailand is on the west part of Thailand against Myanmar. Was, in fact, I was just a few miles away from Pastor Glenn when he was there in Myanmar. I was in Kanchanaburi. I think it was the end of January or 30 February, something. And while we were there, um, we were driving through this beautiful area. It's mountainous and it's, it, it, it's, it's famous to many of you who are older because they did a movie called Bridge Over the River Kwai. And that movie was done there where Death Railroad was and the Japanese caused so many people to die um, in the un unbelievable conditions. And so while driving there, we went through a village and Sarah heard God say to her, take notice, keep your eyes open. So as she was driving, she suddenly said, Yanni, did you see that? And I said, no. She said, that, that, that home has got a cross on it. And I looked for a little cross on the wall and you might not think that that's interesting, but if you're living in Thailand, you must understand having a cross on your home in a 99.4% Buddhist uh, population is quite a bold move. Well, I never saw the cross, so off we went, and the next day we were coming back, and we decided we're going to pop in and see these people. We got to the door, the door was closed, and in Thailand, if the door is closed, it means they're either at work or they don't want guests at that time. Door open means come in. So, we took off, and as we took off, the Lord said to me, go back. Notice both times required sensitivity. We had no idea what we were stepping into. So we went back, knocked on the door, and after a while, a man came to the door, and he was, he was terrible in, in his physical shape. He, his legs were about that thin. He, was, he could hardly stand. He was holding on to the door, and uh, he wasn't that old. I mean, he was like 45 years old. And behind him came his daughter, the same, looks the same. Look like they're starving to death. She's got a disease in her eye, her eye is blind. I mean, they look terrible. So Sarah said, we've just popped in to visit you because we saw the cross outside. And, you know, we're Christians, we, wanna, we just want to speak with you Christians, you know. He said, I'm not a Christian. So she said, well, what about the cross? Big cross, this big planted in the very front of his garden, right by the road. Clear as anything, everybody can see it. He said, I'm not a Christian. He said, so we said, why is the cross there? He said, because since a child, I've loved that symbol. And I want it wherever I go. So we asked him, we said, do you know what that symbol means? He said, I've got no idea. What a wonderful moment. Maybe you like a person that we met in Thailand, you've never heard the real story of the cross. We told him that a loving father took his only son because he was pure, the spotless lamb without blemish. And he allowed him to be sacrificed on the cross that his blood would flow and that blood would be taken into the heavenly tabernacle and would be sprinkled on the mercy seat so that you and I could be reconciled to God and we become his children and that he would bless us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, that we'll be seated with Christ in heavenly places. Amen. He gave us new life.
And as we told him the story, the, these two wept uncontrollably. And we had the pleasure. Sarah led them to Christ. And as they received him, the man said, I need to tell you a story. Two nights ago, I had a dream. And I dreamt that a man came on a cloud to me. And he looked at me. He didn't talk. But he spoke to me through his eyes. And he said, everything is going to be okay. He said, three months ago, I lost my wife. He said, I, I, I've got this disease. I don't know what it is. I can't work. I can't walk. He says, my daughter's got this disease on her eyes. He said, and today the door was closed because we had eaten our last food. The last little bit of rice that we had, we ate today. And because we've put the cross up, nobody speaks to us. Nobody will help us. He says, we have no hope but just to die. We don't have any other choice. Sarah said, we're going to change that. And she went to the car and she got the basket filled with what women do, sandwiches and uh, cookies and fruit and cool drinks. And, and we gave that to them. And they were so overjoyed. So overjoyed. And I'd just drawn money from the ATM. So I had a big roll of cash and I'd stuck it in his hand. And he cried. He wept uncontrollably as he realized that God had cared for him. God had done what he promised he would do. God had sent him somebody who would be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. I laid my hands on them both and I commanded healing to come. We didn't stay long enough to see them fully healed. But I'm confident that they're going to grow and grow in the things of the Lord and have an awesome testimony about how God cares. And this story is not finished, sadly. They told us a story of Christians that had come to them before and had taken photos of their house and their condition and everything about them. And they said they were going to go back to America and they were going to show this to a group of people and then they would send them the money that they collected. You know what happened, don't you? They never sent them any money. I, I, I don't, maybe I shouldn't even go here because I just get too uptight. When people use other people's misfortune to make money, I don't know what you call that. I don't know what you call that. But we, Sarah and I, have made a decision deep in our hearts. Do you understand? This is a, a driving feature of my life. No matter what comes, all I can do is listen. I don't have another steering wheel. My only steering wheel in life is the voice of God. Some people, it's their brains. Some people, it's their money, their position. There is only one thing that Christians are supposed to do, is to be led by the Spirit. To show that they are true sons of God. Amen. Romans 8.14 Them that are led by the Spirit are the mature children of God. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to say to you, you need to, you need to build this into your families. If we do not prepare another generation, if we do not show our children how to hear God, if we do not show our children how to obey God, then I'm telling you what we're doing is we're, we're developing a culture that is not the culture of the kingdom. Amen. And our homes should re reflect the culture of the kingdom. Amen. Total obedience to the Holy Ghost. Amen. Yes. Total obedience to the Holy Ghost. We don't compromise. Where our, where our family goes is up to God. If he wants us to move, we're going to move. If he wants us to give, we're going to give. Anything you say is okay. I can tell you stories all day of how I built a culture of uh, obedience to the voice of God in my family. My little daughter goes the other day to the market with her mother. I love Thailand's markets. Uh, any, any of you ever been to Thailand markets? 
Yeah, they're lovely, aren't they? They've got f- fresh fish, you've got gross vegetables, all that stuff that they do, all their, their sweets and their... It, it is just wonderful. And the Thai people are so lovely. That's why it's called the land of smiles. <laughs> Thai people are always smiling. I don't think they feel like it, but they always smile. <laughs> so, she goes with her mom to the, the market and she comes walking back and she's in tears. Now she turned 10 just two days ago. And so I wasn't home for her birthday. That's tough. Do you understand that? Yes. And what's worse, I sang to her. Yes. <laughs> so when I finish singing, she's giggling. I said, what are you laughing at? She said, I just want to say thank you very much, Dad. <laughs> she, she laughs at my voice because, well, we're not going to go there. So she comes back from the market. She climbs into the, the car, and she's crying. I said, what is it, sweetheart? She said, Dad, I saw a very old lady on the side of the road, and as I looked at her, God said to me, she's got no money, and I don't have any money on me to give her. I said, here. <laughs> Take it. Pay me back. You see, that's a mistake we make. We think we can give to our children and they then can give to others. They've never learned anything by that. If you borrow, you pay back. Never make life simple for your kids. (laughs) Trees only get strong when they face wind. If you... If you make everything simple for your children, if they never have to struggle, you are making weak people. You know that resistance will always develop. Create an environment of resistance. It's not part of my sermon. Let me carry on. So she went down the road, found the old lady, just put the money in her hand and came running back. From small, she's learned the only way we live is God talks to us. When God speaks, we do it. Ladies and gentlemen, your second principle is that we develop a selflessness. A selfless, it's not about me. Not my will, but thine be done. Jesus showed us very clearly that he wasn't living for himself, he was living for others. A selfless life. Not a selfish life. One of your greatest problems in marriages, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to know, there's a simple truth on how to make your marriage a hundred times better. Live for the other person, don't live for yourself. I'm going to say that slowly because you're not catching me. (laughs) Live for the other person, not for yourself. Well, you don't know what my partner's like. I don't care what your partner's like. Jesus made it very plain when he called his disciples. He said, if you want to come after me, deny yourself. First command, deny yourself. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, at the end, he says, I beat my body, lest it gains mastery over me. I don't punch into the air. I hammer myself. So I train myself not to think about me. The only antidote to a a, a life that is really away from God is to die to yourself. Not to get what I want. Not to to sing Blue Eyes a song. I did it. (laughs) Do, Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Are you, I, wonder, I want you to look me in the eyes. Are you selfish? Do you always want things your way? It's always your seat. It's always your parking. It's always your food. It's always mine. It's all about me. See, we don't teach kids this one. I'm amazed at some places I go to. Man, you know there's cake out and everything in the church. And the, the, there's a little, a little kid who walks in, doesn't look, doesn't talk, grabs the cake and walks out. Last piece. That was mine. <laughs> I'm only joking. I don't really like cake. It's the truth. 
But I'm looking at that piece of cake and I'm thinking, I wonder who in here would like a second piece? Man had no chance to even think. Little Johnny just helps himself. Does not ask, does not check. I come first. I know exactly what his home is like. Mommy is always making sure he gets dealt first. My little Nora found out very quickly that if you're around me, there is a culture of, of the kingdom that you're going to have to live. And that culture is thinking about others first. She used to have this little thing that what she would do is flick her fingers and say, Nam. Nam means water. Sitting at the table, halfway through the meal, she goes, Nam. What did you just say? <laughs> she said, Nam. So I said, no, you're going to learn something, Nora. It is not Nam. We never... Uh, we never get something without asking for it. And there is a way you ask. Before you ask, you put a little word called? Uh, you all know. Today I'm amazed at how little even adults understand a culture of honor. Amen. Please. Please may I have this. And when you get it, so I pour her water. She says, please, Dad, may I have some water? No problem. Pour it for her. Give it to her. She just grabs a glass. I'm not letting it go. She said, I ask, please. I said, when you want it, you ask, please. When you get it, you say? Thank you. Got it. I want to tell you it's the will of God concerning us that we are thankful in all things. Yes. The sign of a kingdom touch on your heart is that you have become aware of other people <coughs> and you don't live for yourself. You're constantly sensitive to the other person. You're constantly aware there's an elderly person in this room. I go to a, a pastor's house one day uh, on this trip. He's got his chair, the pastor, his wife's got her chair. There's a sofa with three seats on it and a, a chair for the dog. It's covered in hair. Not dog, dogs. <laughs> and there lying across the sofa is a six foot five sunny boy who's busy watching his TV movie. Everybody else has to watch because he wants to watch. I walk into the house. I'm well known to these people. He doesn't flinch. <laughs> So I stand. Like, does anybody notice I need a seat? Nothing. Sunny boy lies there, so I stand in front of his TV. He just stretches his neck. <laughs> I and I, it was, my chair was going to be the dog's chair. I should have realized that. The sunny boy just lies out on the, guess what the culture he's being taught? It's okay to be selfish. I want to tell you, if he was my son, if he was not out of that chair, standing straight up, shaking the hand, looking into the eyes of the person, and asking him, what can I get you to drink? Please have a seat. There would be action in my house. <laughs> I mean it. They would be on the floor. If, I, if, if a, a guest walked in and you don't jump up, you're going to hit that floor, I'm telling you. <laughs> There's a culture. There's a culture we have to build. Because until, until we get it in the core of our being, when life comes at us, we won't know what to do. Jesus, well, aren't you glad Jesus never had any other complications? He had the perfect kingdom culture. He was totally, totally sensitive. He was totally selfless. And he was totally third sacrificial. Jesus sacrificed himself. He gave his very best. He left heaven's throne. He came down in the form of a man. He took on a, the form of a servant. He made sure that he died on a cross. So you and I today can claim the name of Jesus. That we can be, declare that we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. 
Your and my behavior has consequences. Your and my behavior has consequences on other people. If we are selfish, it has consequences. If we are not sacrificial, it has consequences. David says this, he says, I'll not give to the Lord that which has not, not cost me something. When last did you and I give in a way that cost us? I was driving to Ohio the other day. And as I was driving along, I got a chance to phone a few people and I was talking to one of my friends who, the guy's rich, really rich. Um, but, but he never flashes it. He's, just a, he's a nice guy, really nice guy. Every time he talks to me, he talks to me about my weight. He's got no weight problem, but he's always telling me about the diet he's on. <laughs> so I know what he's trying to do is you know, get me on board. So I said, I've got some good news for you, my boy. Next to me is a stop and shop little uh, plastic container that has carrots, uh, broccoli, little red tomatoes. I said, uh, not tomatoes, tomatoes. <laughs> and so I said, next to that, the bottles of water. I've got no sodas. And I said, next to that are apples. He said, do you know how many carbohydrates in an apple? <laughs> I said, no, I don't know. He says, ask your phone. I said, listen, bud. <laughs> my phone is so old, you've got to warm it up first, then you've got to crank it a few times. Then it only starts. I said, if I talk to my phone, it'll blow up. But there's no way it'll work. He says, well, don't you have an iPad? I said, yes, one of those that are so old, you try and update it, it ends up chucking the update because it hasn't got the software to cope with the update. And he goes dead quiet. And I know in the moment what's happening to him. He's feeling moved to buy me a, an iPad. I know it. But he doesn't pass the test. He goes, let's go back to those apples. <laughs> he missed his moment to sacrifice. God's giving us all an opportunity to sacrifice. By the way, I went to the next church, told the story to the leadership as a just saying how weird we are as Christians. And before the end of the night, I had an Android phone and I had a, an iPad 3. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. The Android phone is... I'm just learning to talk to it. It's fantastic. <laughs> but she's got a problem. She keeps telling me, can you please say that again? <laughs> like I've got an accent. Anyway. <laughs> he missed his moment. Every single day, every week, God is giving you and I an opportunity to sacrifice for the kingdom. To give something that costs us. When we get here to worship, and, and, and you know, we, we just don't feel so excited as we did last week. Well, then we just tone down our worship. The Bible is clear. We've got to give a sacrifice of praise. That means something that costs you. That means lifting your hands when you don't want to. The only reason to, today that I've broken out of my conservatism is because I was willing to sacrifice. I was willing, willing to raise my hands even though I thought I looked like an idiot. I broke barriers in my sacrificing. I kept learning how to give more and more and more. I kept learning how to give money. I, I hated giving money. Anybody felt like that before? Raise your hand, please. The, praise God, a few honest people. I hated giving money when I got first born again. I, when they brought the money past for us to put the offering in, I put in what I had, which was a note, but I wanted to put a coin. I didn't have a coin. So what I did is I then pulled the guy back, put my hand in, pulled out the stuff, grabbed the change I wanted, and dropped the, the little bit into the thing. So, I mean, I was as rude as they come. I did not want to give any money away. Today, Sarah and I are in such danger of giving away everything we've got. We've given away such big things so many times. 
We've learned that you can never outgive God. If you know what I'm talking about, say amen. amen. Nothing leaves the heavenly realm unless it first leaves the natural realm. Nothing leaves the heavenly realm until it first you sow, you sow to reap. You don't sow to reap, but in, when you sow, you reap. When you give, it'll be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. The measure you use will be measured on you. You and I need to realize that God is looking for cheerful givers. He's looking for people that, that find the joy in, in observing the kingdom, observing others, and making a decision to get involved and to make a difference. When last have you sacrificed? I mean really sacrificially given to the Lord of your time, of your possessions. America, you have no idea how blessed you are. I don't know of another country that the poor drive cars. I don't know another country like it. You are extremely blessed. Too much has been given. Much is required. Don't deceive yourself. I've been here long enough that I can talk like this. People know that I'm not here for what I can get. I'm here for what I can give. Nobody can accuse me of that ever. So I can look at you in the eyes and say, what are you doing with all that God has given you? When last did you make a strategic move? Because listen to me, if you will break a barrier in your giving, God will change your circumstances forever. I'm going to say it again. If you can break a barrier in your giving, God will change your circumstances forever. So what are you going to do about that? How are you going to sacrifice? How are you going to work in the house? The hours you give to, to help the kingdom grow. You see, all these things are choices we make. And they form a culture in our lives. And the last one is servanthood. Servanthood, learning to be a servant. How can I serve you? How can I help you? What can I do to push you forward? Jesus says, we are not like the Gentiles who lord it over others. We are here to serve. Jesus says, I have not come to be served, but to serve and give my life a ransom for many. I want to tell you something. You have, you have in your leadership a model of these four things. They live these lives. Amen. They are outstanding people. I'm, I'm not ashamed to preach on this subject in front of them. So often I have to preach things in front of pastors that I know they are cringing in their seats because they don't do it. But this house has got a culture. It's got a culture of care. It's got a culture that honors others. And I tell you, you cannot build a strong culture until you've built a culture in your own heart. That is a foundation to everything you do. A culture that, number one, starts off in sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. No matter where I am, what can I do, Lord? Selflessness. It's not about me. How can I be sensitive to people in this room? How, how can we get a couple of young men when it's raining standing outside with umbrellas waiting for people getting out of the cars and just serving them? Teach them a culture. Old people struggling to get up this walkway. I looked at this walkway. I thought, this is difficult for older people. This is difficult. And I know it's not in the heart of anybody to make it difficult. But it is what it is. How can we change that? How can we get a little buggy, buy it, and then just take people up four at a time, six at a time? No children on the buggy. No sick, lame, and lazy. Do you understand what I'm saying? Serve. Serve. Think of others. Selfless. 
sacrificial. Build this into your families. I beg you. I beg you. Let's be the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Let's be different. Let people look at us and say, these people are truly different. Raise your hand to the Lord and just receive, would you? I just want to bless you in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, I pray right now, Lord, that deep inside, as men and women have heard this story, as they've heard what we preached, that, Lord, they would choose to adjust their lives to a new level, a new way of serving you, a new way of giving of themselves, a new way of blessing others. Lord, cause obedience to flow in this room even today so that somebody who is even dying gets intersected by the love of God. God, teach us to listen to that quiet voice and be willing to dig deep into what we have to change somebody's life. Help us to be Barnabases that lift people to another position, that open doors for people. I was saying to Pastor Nick today, Pastor Glenn is the first man ever in America to open doors for me to other places. He has taken the time to think about me and where I'm going. He doesn't just hear, he facilitates opportunities. I'm forever grateful. I am where I am today because of this man being selfless, servant-hearted, sacrificial, and sensitive to the Holy Spirit. May that fall on you. May you catch the culture of your leaders in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you.